Hello. My name is Gilbert Carlson. I'm Director of Technical Services for ITT Fluid Handling. And we will be discussing now the pump tank interrelationship necessary for good pumping application on closed loop systems. We originally introduced this concept something to the order of 30 years ago, at which time we went through the country introducing the importance of pumping away from the compression tank on a closed loop system. What we will do is to go through a series of slides illustrating the importance of this, and then we'll introduce again the basic fundamental ideas as initially proposed some 30 years ago, and which led to the application almost universally of pumps pumping away from the junction of the compression tank with the piping system. So let's start out then with a simple illustration of a piping system. This is shown in the diagram in which we are illustrating a building which has the elevation shown of 23 feet to the second floor, 11 and a half feet to the first floor, the pressure drops through the terminal units on the system, and we are also illustrating gauge points relevant to this piping system. Now, if we installed on that piping system a pump, boiler, and so on and so forth, and the pump was not in operation, we would simply have the static pressures exerted by the water in terms of fill pressure. You will notice we're starting at 14 pounds at the compression tank, disregarding the static elevation differences of the tank to the piping system. We have 14 pounds basically on the first floor. We have nine pounds basically on the second floor and four pounds on the top floor. So this is then without the pump in operation. Let us now start the pump and see what would happen for this circumstance with the pump pumping away from the compression tank. The pump, you will note, is starting at 14 pounds at its pump suction. The pump curve is stating this, that at the flow rate required by the pumping system, we have 46 feet of pumping head, which converts, of course, to 20 PSI differential across the pump. So starting at a suction pressure of 14 PSI, we are developing at the pump discharge then, 34 PSI. We originally started at 14, if you remember. And proceeding upward in the piping system, of course, we're losing some static pressure because of elevation. And we are developing 24 PSI at this point. We are also losing pressure drop passing through the terminal. So our pressure at the leaving part of the terminal will then be 19 PSI. Proceeding upward in the system, you can see that starting at a lower pressure, our pump is always increasing pressure as the pump operates in this piping system. Now the reason for this has to do with tank location, and it follows what one might normally expect in terms of pump curve application. Because a pump curve states foot head versus GPM, and it always states 
foothead in a positive manner. So this is what we would logically expect. But let's say we have considered NPSH. And we know that with the requirements for NPSH, that the pump located in the colder area of the pumping system, in other words, on the return side, would seem more logical because the pump in this location is pumping colder water and would therefore, it would seem, pump better. This is common sense. But common sense has been defined as that feeling that led so many people for so many years to believe the world was flat. Because in this location, we're pumping away from the compression tank location in the piping system. Let's change that and put the pump where it should not be on the return side pumping into the compression tank. So, we shall then start with the pump on the return side discharging into the compression tank location and we shall see what would happen. If we had 14 pounds at the compression tank, this would remain unchanged. Disregarding the elevation difference, we would have 14 pounds at the entrance to the boiler. Assuming that we had very little pressure drop through the boiler, we would have 14 pounds at the pump discharge. Let us again consider the pump curve. The pump curve again states GPM versus foot head. And the pump is expected to develop 46 feet of head, equating to 20 PSI. Now the important point is this, that if we tell that pump its discharge pressure is to be fixed at 14 PSI, and the pump will develop 20 PSI across the pump, how and what will happen to the pump suction pressure? because the pump is concerned only with one thing, and that is developing a pressure difference across the pump. We have then a real meaning of the pump curve, which is differential foot head. So if we hold the discharge pressure constant, but the pump develops 20 PSI across itself, we will then have 14 PSI at the pump suction and a pressure at the pump suction of a negative 6 PSI. Proceeding upward in this piping system, each time we go up one level in elevation, we will reduce pressure by 5 PSI. So at this point, we will have a negative 11 and at the very top of the piping system, we will have overcome one of the problems faced by those working with low pressures, and we will have exceeded an absolute zero pressure reading because we would decrease the pressure to a negative 16. Of course, this could not occur. We could not drop to less than absolute zero which would be a negative 14.7, and water would flash in the top of the piping system. Now, because we are not flowing water in the upper levels of the piping system, great consternation would occur, much weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, and people would become very unhappy. One of the first thoughts might be that we do not have proper flow balance. So we'll place balance valve here and attempt to balance, which will not solve the problem because it is the action of the pump itself 
that is causing the difficulty. The next thought might be that, well, we're air binding the system. And we'll put then an air vent in the top of that system, send some fitter up there to vent the system. He opens the vent, gets sucked into the piping system, and is never, ever heard from again. Now, as soon as we open the vent at the top of the system and or we apply an automatic air vent, the automatic air vent does not have a very large brain. When the pressure drops to less than atmospheric, it will suck air into the piping system. This air will travel down the piping to the pump suction, enter the pump. The pump will then deload, will not pump the required amount of water. And because of the deloading, will introduce problems as soon as air is passed out of the pump because the new water being introduced into the pump will then slam against the pump impeller in some circumstances twisting off the pump itself, the pump shaft itself. And because of this, we can't, in many cases, break pump shafts. We will have airbound pumps. We will have mechanical seals malfunctioning and a whole host of difficulties that will proceed from this unfortunate tank-pump interrelationship. The solution to the problem is to move the pump so it pumps away from the junction of the tank with the piping system. Now then, let's proceed with why this is true. And this gets back to the fundamental ideas proposed at Bell and Gossett some 30 years ago. And we'll proceed with the original analysis, which has not been illustrated for many years. The original analysis follows this pattern, that we'll have a compression tank. And that compression tank is partially full of air and is partially full of water. Now that tank is connected to a piping system. And on that piping system, we have a pump. So let's proceed then with a series of questions as to what will happen for this piping system when we start the pump. The first question has to do with air in that tank and the pressure exerted by that air on the piping system. What will change the air pressure in the tank? The only thing that will change the air pressure in the tank is a change of water volume in the tank. This is considered, of course, an isothermal situation. So what will then change the air volume in the tank? The only thing that can change the air volume in the tank is the water volume in the tank. Now the tank is connected to the pumping system, usually using a B&G air separator or roller troll. And is connected to piping which is filled with water. So what will then change the water volume in the tank? Supposing we start the pump, will the pump change the water volume in the piping system? So the water volume change in the piping system is then exerted as a water volume change in the tank, which is then exerted as an air volume change in the tank, which is then exerted as a pressure change. And the question is, can the pump change water volume? The pump cannot change water volume. It can make the water flow, but it cannot change its water volume. And because of this, cannot change the water volume in the tank, and therefore cannot change the air volume in the tank, and therefore cannot change the air pressure in the tank. Now then, if the pump is pumping away from 
the junction of the tank with the piping system. It must be established that the pump suction pressure is established by the tank pressure and the pump will then exert a positive pressure on the system in terms of operation because it will exert a differential pressure across itself in terms of establishing the operating pressure on the system. The pressure at the pump suction remaining essentially constant. So if the pump is pumping away from the tank, system pressure must increase. Now conversely, if the pump discharges into the tank location with the piping system, we are telling the pump again that the pump discharge pressure now will be fixed by the tank pressure and inasmuch as the pump must exert a differential pressure across itself, it will establish a decreased pressure at its pump suction and will operate with decreased pressures throughout the piping system, leading to a great deal of operational difficulty. In some ways, pump location relevant to the compression tank on a closed loop piping system corresponds to open loop pumping practice. If the pump discharges into the compression tank, it's as though we had an extremely long suction line. And because of this, and because of the interrelationships previously described, we can very easily run into cavitational problems and the other problems uh, that would cause operational difficulties. Conversely, if the pump pumps away from the compression tank, we are as though we have a very short suction line to an open loop tank leading to minimal difficulties and operational characteristics that should be as required. Now, one other point should be covered. We, as you know, illustrate literature for small residential buildings, which show the pump pumping on the return line and discharging into the boiler with the compression tank generally located on the boiler. Now this is contrary to the statements that we have made so far. On the other hand, there's a very important point, engineering point, that should be discussed. And that has to do with the point that a difference to be a difference has to make a difference. A small residential pump generally creates only about seven foot of head. This corresponds to about a 2 psi reduction in the piping system and that 2 psi reduction in pressure in the residential system does not create problems. For engineers, however, designing systems, they should always design their systems in such a way that the pump pumps away from the compression tank junction with the piping system. And this compression tank junction on the larger systems is generally through a roller troll air separator. And that concludes our discussion of pump tank location requirements for closed loop pumping systems.